Vedic religion, glimmers of Hinduism in the past. Part one, when a religion without a beginning began. Previously, as we discussed Confucianism and Taoism, we mentioned how these terms were European categories foisted onto Chinese and other East Asian peoples both in the distant past and in the colonialists present. And we left with the question of whether or not we can speak of something called Chinese religion. Are Confucianism and Taoism sects of some larger religion called Chinese religion? Or are they completely distinct in some essential way? So can we discuss Taoism as if Confucianism doesn't exist, or vice versa? Or are they so deeply interlocked that they're both expressions of something we can call Chinese religion? The European colonialists never spoke of religion in China in that way, and so we don't either. But in the case of the subcontinent, that is, the lands that today comprise the nations of Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, and Sri Lanka, the Europeans did just that. In all the lands which comprise Greater India, the colonizers applied a category called the Indian religion. Using an older word for India from Persian and Arabic, Hind, English speakers spoke of Hinduism, Indiaism. All of the many peoples, languages, practices, beliefs, and cultures of the subcontinent a place which is, by the way, more densely populated and more diverse than Europe, they were all clumped together. There was no attempt to connect all of these phenomena to a historical founder, like the word Confucianism does to Confucius. And there was no attempt to connect all these people back to a certain belief, like the word Taoism does to people who believe in the Tao. No, it was simply that if you were from a place called Hind, the Indian subcontinent, you are now an adherent of Hinduism. Just because the notion of Hinduism is a recent concept, first appearing in 1787, that doesn't mean that we can't study the people that word was made to categorize. So, just because there's no pre-modern notion of any word like Hinduism, that doesn't have to suggest that it doesn't refer to a certain reality. After all, there are many people who today would identify themselves as Hindus, and their religion as Hinduism. So how to proceed? Hinduism is a construct in name, so tracing the term Hinduism would just lead us to Europe and Persia, not to the people we're actually looking for in the Indian subcontinent. And as there's no founder of Hinduism, we can't go back to the religion's founding either. And as there's no one clear belief that all Hindus share, we can't trace a particular belief. And so, to move forward, we're going to have to be a bit circular. We're going to start in the ancient past, but we're only going to be looking at things which modern Hindus today would identify as part of their religion. So if there's some pre-modern practice or thought that a modern Hindu would say is part of Hinduism, we're going to look at that and overlook the fact that ancient peoples would not have recognized the category of Hinduism or any other shared cultural system that supposedly contains the entire Indian subcontinent. Part 2. The Devas and the Vedas. People who are recognizably Hindu began with the so-called Harappan or Indus Valley civilization, which thrived from about 3000 to 1500 BCE. We notice that they had a number of images that survive to us today, and they seem to use lots of fertility symbols. For common examples, we could see female figurines with exaggerated breasts and hips. We can suppose these are fertility goddesses who provide crops and children, not unlike comparable goddesses in modern forms of Hinduism. 
Likewise, we can also see male imagery, like images of a horned animal god, an early version of the god that would later be called Shiva. And we can also see phallic shrines, which today are also associated with Shiva. Although we can suppose this much through the archaeological record, we don't know as much about the Harappans as we would like. We can't understand their writing system or language, and that hurts. And therefore, how exactly their religion influenced modern Hindus, and how much it influenced those Hindus, is hotly debated. So, let's move into some relatively safe conjecture. In this case, it's conjecture about sexual imagery. Let's get the giggles out of the way up front. When we see a people whose religion invokes lots of images of breasts, hips, and phalluses, that tells us something important. Sexuality refers to plentifulness, the production of new life, like children. It also refers to other kinds of productions of new life, most especially agriculture. Pay a visit to the state capital of Iowa in Des Moines. There, you'll see this statue of a certain well-endowed, rather sexualized woman. Well, this is Iowa herself, as it were. It's a presentation of a place and a people who are very dependent on agriculture. Their lives and livelihoods depend on abundant harvests and the availability of water. The Harappan images are presumably quite similar. Images of women with large breasts or shrines that suggest men's genitals tell us that these are a farming people. They're a settled people. Farmers can't be nomadic because crops are fixed in one place. And therefore, there's a religious relationship between plants, the lands that they grow on, and the people who harvest them. The fertility of the people, their sexuality, depends on the fertility of the plants, the harvest and that all depends on the fertility of the land itself. Not every ancient people were settled farmers. Many were nomads and herders. These people would have made their way by caring for animals, and unlike plants, cattle and horses move. The settled Harappan civilization was to be replaced by a herding people, who followed their animals' migrations in search of grazing lands. Around 1700 to 1500 BCE, we can start to detect the influx of a new people into the subcontinent. We call them the Indo-Iranians, or the Indo-Europeans, but they would have called themselves the Arya. They first came from Central Asia, and they went wherever their need for livestock took them. One stream of their migrations took them into what is now Europe, and hence Europeans have this notion of Aryans. By the way, the word Aryan has now fallen out of favor because it was used by the Nazis in the 20th century. Another course of the Arya took them to the Persian lands, and hence those lands have the modern name Iran, or Iranian, right? Arya, Iran. And a third path took the Arya into the Indian subcontinent, where they possibly replaced or absorbed the settled Harappans. It's not clear if the Harappan civilization went extinct before or because of the Aryan invasion. Wherever the Arya went, they brought with them their languages. And because of them, there are familial connections between most of the languages of India, Iran, and Europe. This is called the Indo-European or Indo-Iranian language family. It includes Latin, and therefore the Romance languages, like Spanish and French, Greek, Russian, the Persianate languages of Iran, Tajikistan, and Afghanistan, and most of the living languages of India, like Hindi, Punjabi, Gujarati, as well as those in Pakistan, like Urdu. Germanic languages like English are also Indo-European. So that means that the Arya who went to India spoke a distant relative of English. 
One especially important language that some of these people spoke was called Sanskrit. Most of the classical texts and songs of the Hindus are in Sanskrit, and so therefore almost all of the vocabulary that we need to discuss Hinduism is from Sanskrit. Now, I was saying how we don't know as much about the Harappans as we would like, but we do know a lot more about the Arya, because they have records in Sanskrit of their thoughts, songs, and prayers. These records are called the Veda, which means knowledge. Oh, remember how Sanskrit and English are directly connected? Well, Veda is related to the English word wisdom. See the relationship? Veda, wisdom, knowledge. They're from the same thought. The Vedas started out as oral lore. They were hymns to various gods and chants. In Sanskrit, and now in English, the word is mantra. So when you think mantra, think words of religious importance, said in a particular formulaic way. This is done out loud, orally. If you're a nomadic people, you probably don't have the time, resources, or inclination to write much down. And even if you did, that would just be more stuff that you have to carry around with you. And as all college students know, books are rather heavy. So, instead, people would memorize the Vedas, and a certain class of Vedic speakers and reciters developed, essentially professional memorizers, the people that you needed to perform the mantras. These were called the Brahmins. The Brahmins were, and still are, the keepers of the Vedas. They are the priests who know the mantras, can perform the rituals, and later they would become the scribes of the written Veda when writing was more common. The gods of the Arya, addressed by these mantras in the Vedas, as memorized by the Brahmins, were probably at first quite different than the fertility goddesses and gods of the Harappans. By the way, the word for a supernatural being in Sanskrit is Deva, or Devaha. This is from the same root as English words like divine, or devil, or divinity, all words in English that involve supernatural beings too. This belief in the deva and devotions to them blended together with the Harappan religion, but unlike the Harappan fertility gods who represented the fertility of the crops, the Arya's deva were the gods of nomadic peoples. So if agriculturalists tend to worship hypersexualized fertility gods, what do nomads worship? What do nomads think are particularly important? Well, if your life and the lives of your family depend on your livestock, and livestock presumably feed and water themselves for the most part, the biggest threat to your livestock are thieves, invaders, and rival herders. The ability to fight, use weapons, and defend your pasture lands was paramount. Think cowboys. So, first and foremost amongst nomadic people's gods are warrior gods. And that's why we see in the Arya the introduction of Deva like Indra. Indra is a warrior king. He throws thunderbolts as a weapon. He rides a mighty elephant. He flies into rages of battle in the form of storms. He reigns on high mountains or in the sky, watching over his terrain like a herder watches over his herd. This is the kind of god you want if you need to defend your animals and your family. And like a tribal king or chief, Indra and the devas like him demand tribute for their protection. This is done through worship and adoration, which later would be referred to as puja. Although puja is a later word, it came to refer to the kinds of prayer, invocation, adoration to the devas that the Vedas described. Puja literally just means paying honor or adoration, giving homage to a god like a revered guest. There is no one standard puja, but there are some common elements, like the burning of a fire or incense, the presentation of water, foods, or some other gift to the gods, and a vocal invocation of some kind. Now these days, puja is usually associated with the religious rituals one does at home, 
but they could also be done at a temple or in a natural environment as custom, circumstance, and personal preference demands. Here's just one example of invoking the god Indra, the ancestor of the modern form of the puja. This is from the Rig Veda, the oldest strand of the written Vedas. And notice how Indra here is invoked. He is manly and violent. He oversees his property and by singing to him, the singer, the Brahmin priest, asks for the same for himself. The bounteous supporter of the settled domains, worthy of hymns, to Indra have the lofty songs roared. The much invoked one, having grown strong through well-tuned hymns, immortal, awakening every day. The superior man with a hundred resolves, a flood of powers, my songs approach Indra from all sides, winning spoils, splitting strongholds, swift at crossing the waters, attending to the ordinances, attending closely, finding the sun. The singer seeks admiration from him who distributes goods. Indra gives a friendly reception to his faultless rhythms. Praise him, victorious in every way, the smasher of hostility. You, the most manly of men. For Indra, the heavens, the plants, and the waters guard their wealth, and the lively streams and woods. For you, the sacred formulations, for you the songs altogether have been established, O Indra of the fallow bays. Enjoy them. Become a friend of help right now, O comrade, O good one. Establish vigor for the singers. As the Arya became increasingly more settled peoples themselves, their rituals would become quite elaborate. Whole staffs of Brahmin priests each with various areas of specialization and subspecialization, would develop to keep the old Harappan fertility gods and the new Aryan nomadic gods appeased. Part 3. What is scripture? So now we have an oral tradition of wisdom, Vedas, songs, spells, and invocations needed to offer worship to Deva, like Indra. And as the centuries rolled on, these oral traditions moved into written forms, as the Arya grew more settled and established in the kind of economic systems that you need to produce writing materials like ink and vellum. In time, the Vedas would become quite voluminous, comprising four standard volumes containing tens of thousands of independent passages. So now the question is, why is the Vedas important? Interestingly, the worship of Indra is not particularly popular in Hinduism today. He actually has a somewhat minor role, for the most part. And neither do most people regularly practice the kind of rituals that the Vedas describe. Some people do practice some of them, but they're hardly the standard. And no one practices them all, as that would be literally impossible. There are just too many of them, and they're very, very complicated. Furthermore, the Sanskrit language was never a commonly understood tongue. It was never universally known across the subcontinent, or even close to it. And while it's hardly an obscure language, it was at no point in history understood by everybody, not even when the Vedas was being written down. And on top of all that, most people, at most times, had no access to writing and reading anyway. So, the Vedas are not widely followed today. No one follows them all. And they are written in a language that few understand and even fewer can read. So, why aren't the Vedas consigned to obscurity? What do they do, exactly? Well, the value of the Vedas is not what they say primarily, but what they are. Remember how we mentioned that the name Hinduism itself is a construct? It's a catch-all to explain the religious culture of the Indian subcontinent? Well, affirmation of the Vedas as authoritative 
is the closest thing Hinduism has to a litmus test of orthodoxy, of deciding who's in and who's out, who is a Hindu. Now, forget that the word Hinduism or Hindu exists for just a minute. Imagine a vast and ancient land, India, where everyone believes, thinks, and does all sorts of things. There are some people who believe in a certain god, and some people believe in another god, and some people believe in lots of gods, and others believe in no gods at all. And everyone speaks a different language, they practice different rituals, and different customs. And everyone has a different morality system. Some people are strict vegetarians, others eat meat all the time and think nothing of it. Some meditate out in the wilderness, and others have shrines in their homes and marketplaces. Everyone claims to be following the Dharma, their personal duty and the greater order of the cosmos, but everyone's doing very, very different things. Well, without our modern words, like Hinduism or religion, how did people talk about these phenomena and categorize them? Well, there isn't just one answer. But one of the key factors would be that if you agreed with the general principles of the Vedas, that is, did you believe in the devas, some kind of gods, and did you offer them tribute through worship, at least in principle? If you did acknowledge that the Vedas were correct, at least in theory, even if you didn't practice all of the Vedic rituals yourself or worship its specific devas, well, then you were of the pro-Veda party, as it were called the Astikas. Astikas literally just means affirmers, someone who says yes to something existing and being real, the ones who say it is. So the Astika are people who affirm the worldview of the Vedas, that there are all powerful devas who demand worship. Even if you don't exactly follow the Vedas specific gods and formulas, someone who rejects the value of worshipping the devas, and therefore rejects the authority of the Vedic worldview, is a Gnostica, a naysayer, someone who says no to something, literally one who says it is not. Buddhists would fall into this category, because they believe in the existence of the devas, but they don't necessarily claim that everyone has to offer these devas tribute. And scriptures like the Vedas would come to take on a religious role of their own, the literatures which tell you how to perform religion would in time themselves become the objects of religious feelings. This is the case of the Vedas and other such writings that came later. These would be called Shruti, that which has been heard. Remember that for centuries, the only way to gain access to the Vedas was to hear it spoken and performed in rituals. So these ancient fundamentally important words were called the things you heard, the Shruti. Some wise person inspired by the gods spoke wise words in some distant past, and then they told those words to others, who in turn told others, who in turn told others. The ancient knowledge, the Vedas, heard from ancient sages. But it wasn't just written by those sages or created by them in some mundane sense. It was heard by them. They didn't just make this stuff up, supposedly, but rather they tapped into something eternal and beginningless. So to say that the Vedas are Shruti is to say that they expose something timeless of the universe, the Dharma, which never changes and is always authoritative. To say that a certain piece of literature is Shruti, heard, means that it taps into something eternal about the cosmos. The Vedas have been important as Shruti, as the wisdom heard from the gods, as far back as the historical record can take us. But that importance took on a new dimension in the modern period, when the label of Hinduism appeared. Because the word Hinduism comes from the West, it brings with it this notion called religion. And with the notion of religion comes a lot of other baggage too. For instance, assumptions about what a religion is, what a religion must do, and the elements that a religion has to possess in order to be considered a religion in the first place. For just one instance, consider scripture. Western Christians, and most especially Western Protestant Christians, are particularly invested in a concept called scripture. 
Scripture just literally means writing, but it originally refers to a particular collection of writings called the Bible. The Bible is very, very important to Protestant Christians, and therefore, when Protestant Christians spread their notion of religion around the world, they brought with them, hidden inside the thought called religion, a very particular concept called scripture. Now, this isn't to say that non-Protestant Christians didn't think that there were writings that were important to their lives somehow. Other non-Protestant Christians also had the Bible, just as some people in India had the written Vedas. It's just that the presence of the notion of religion brought with it a particularly Protestant Christian conception of the notion of writings. It's something like a false analogy. Protestants have a concept called religion. And for these people, religions need a scripture called the Bible in order to function. Therefore, if someone has another religion, that other religion must also have its own scripture, and they need those scriptures in order to function. Now, it is true there are plenty of non-Protestants and even non-Christians who have various kinds of important religious texts. The Vedas is just one of these. We'll meet others too. But built into the notion of religion are the following assumptions. First, all religions have a scripture. Second, all scripture is written, and therefore, it's unchanging. Third, all religious people read that written scripture. Fourth, all religious people try to obey their scripture. This kind of thinking, which is still quite common in the West today, springs out of a very particular reading of Protestant Christianity, and it, in turn, warped the way those Protestant Christians saw other people's traditions, and in turn, finally, how those people saw themselves. Remember, when you think of the colonialization process, most of the colonial powers were Protestant Christians. Now, let's take a look at this list of four items again, and apply what we know about the Vedas. First, there was certainly religious activity in India before the Vedas appeared there. For example, we saw this in the Harappan civilization, which predated the arrival of the Sanskrit-speaking Vedic Arya. So, there we see a religion that doesn't have a scripture. Second, not all scripture is written, as the Vedas were bouncing around orally amongst the Brahmin for centuries before some of them were started to get written down. Third, the overwhelming majority of people in ancient India, like the majority of everyone almost everywhere, couldn't read. And even if you could read Sanskrit, how many copies of the written Vedas were in circulation at a given time? A few dozen, maybe? Writing manuscripts is expensive and time-consuming, especially very long ones like the Vedas. So even literate people might not have access to one. The vast, vast majority of religious people in the pre-modern world couldn't get their hands on the written copy of the Vedas even if they wanted to, and even fewer could do anything with that written copy if they found one. And fourth, just because a certain Hindu accepts that the Vedas is authoritative somehow, that doesn't mean that she's trying to follow its every practice to the letter, as if that was even possible anyway. Instead, she uses that text, which again, she may have never even read, as a signifier for something else. A Hindu can use the Vedas as a marker for inclusion in a certain community of people, do you think that everyone who has a Jesus fish on their car has read the whole Bible from cover to cover? Do you think that everyone who has a Darwin fish on their car has actually read the origin of the species? No, of course not. Those texts are being used in such a way to say which group someone belongs to. And there are other uses of scriptures too, which we'll meet over the next few discussions.
Here are some thoughts for class. What do we know about the religious world of the Harappan civilization? Can you identify Vedas, Mantra, Brahman, Deva, Puja, Astika and Nastika, and Shruti? What is a scripture, and what are some things one can do with it? A lot of the thoughts I discussed above were pulled from the following. A Survey of Hinduism by Klaus Klostermeyer, 2007. The long chapter called Hinduism by Dermot Killingsley in Major World Religions from Their Origins to the Present, edited by Lloyd Rigian. If you want to take a look at the Rig Veda in more detail, check out the translation by Stephanie W. Jameson and Joel P. Brereton, 2014.